Next we have Wendy Nather. She is Director of Advisory CISOs at Geosecurity, and she will be talking to us about how threat actors are exploiting supplier and customer trust. Of course, this past year has been the year of supplier chain attacks, so it feels particularly relevant. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you, and hello. So as... Um, as Tom Waits, uh, the singer Tom Waits said uh, one time, I want to pull on your coat about something. I want to I just run some ideas by you and, and see what you think. This is something that has been bothering me for some time about the denial of trust. Now, obviously, there's a lot of talk about the erosion of trust in, uh, in terms of people behaving badly. We just had a fantastic um, presentation by Andrea that went into a lot of detail on that sort of thing. Uh, influence operations, psychological operations, um, you know, forgery, civil unrest in general is causing people to stop trusting one another. And um, it, uh, we have the problem with data misuse, which, um, you know, people are, uh, things are being overly broadly collected, resold, reused, and then, of course, bad stewardship. Even when data is legitimately collected, it's not being protected in accordance with its requirements. So all of that is causing us to lose trust in institutions. But what I am really wondering about is how, how can this be turned into a systemic attack or a system type attack? So what I'm talking about is either subtle or overt corruption of data, integrity attacks on data, so that um, it, to, to, to cause failures or, or simply to undermine trust. And again, we saw in, in the Stuxnet talk by Kim, we saw uh, you know, a lot of how corruption of data, especially feedback from industrial control systems, can cause sabotage. But I'm thinking more about broader business data. For example, imagine um, just quietly dropping the drug allergy information from a health record. Uh, if there's nothing in there. Uh, by the way, this is why nurses will ask you 15 times if you have any drug allergies, because they don't trust the record and they shouldn't. But that sort of thing where, you know, it's silently, uh, data is missing, important data. Or think about legal contracts. Words mean a whole lot in legal contracts and phrasing and punctuation, everything. Can you imagine going up to a judge and saying, you know, you're in mid-argument, you say, as it says on page 86, and the judge says, that's not what it says on page 86, and finding that the meaning has been significantly changed. Uh, think about changing the recipe of your favorite frozen dinner. You know, uh, wow, this mac and cheese is really bad. Um, any, any sort of that type of business data, that could be really devastating. And the other side of it is simply accusing somebody of having that kind of breach, that kind of corruption of data, because it's very, very painful to try to prove a negative. So you could just say that they had, they had a breach. Um, and that can already play havoc with their reputation, uh, you know, with their operational processes as they try to find this out. So I'm sorry, but before I go anywhere else, uh, uh, please do not say blockchain is the answer to this. Um, for reasons that I'll get into later. So if you're a blockchain fan, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, let, let, let's just not go there because this would be a, a very short talk. <laughs> One of the reasons is, well, no, and contrary to rumor, there is no child porn on the blockchain. This was a rumor that somebody started. Um, and as people who are, are knowledgeable explained it, even if uh, there, there is no actual child porn material in a, g a given blockchain, at the most it might be a URL that went to some place that had child porn, but it wouldn't be resident exact, you know, in the blockchain itself. But simply accusing it, uh, you know, this makes my point, uh, if you simply accuse it, suddenly it taints all of the data on there in a very spectacular way. So this is why these sorts of attacks are things that are, are concerning to me. Um, this is a great article by a gentleman who took around a honeypot laptop with him for two years, and he would leave it in his hotel room, and he tried to figure out whether it had been tampered with in the meantime. And he describes in this article all the different things that he checked forensically and otherwise, and he could not satisfy himself that it had not been tampered with. 
either he never found anything. So either nobody cared enough to tamper with it or he simply couldn't find it. But either way, he couldn't figure it out. Uh, so this is, this is a big problem. So what, what would the, why would the, this be a big problem for us? First of all, integrity attacks are, are less noticeable than outright denial of service. Detecting the origin of the change of the data, when it happened, how it happened, where it happened, requires deep event logging that a lot of organizations do not have the capability to have. A lot of them cannot afford to log um, even all write events, much less all read events. Um, and most of the logging, most of the security uh, products that we have today that have to do with monitoring and logging are all about detecting access, but not necessarily what they did within the application. That's usually left to the developers to decide what level of logging they should be doing, what kind of changes they should be tracking. And if they haven't thought of this, uh, you know, then it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, there are some organizations I know of, of a couple of retailers where they have so many agents on their endpoints already that they cannot put any forensic agents on unless they can already prove that there has been a breach so that they can investigate it. So think about this. They have to prove there's a breach before they can investigate to prove that there's a breach. So for all of those reasons, we are not collecting and, and logging changes to data in ways that would help us detect this. The other thing is that depending on where the data dependencies are, what is being changed as a result of those alterations, you may need to revalidate the data at scale. Y you may have months, you know, years, whatever, of, of data um, spread across you know, multiple systems, huge volumes, and then revalidating that could cost a company an enormous amount. The other problem is that the fraud department, by and large, cares about financial transactions, but not about other types of data transactions. Uh, again, uh, I, I worked for the retail ISAC in the United States and found that a lot of those um, companies, the fraud department, uh, the cybersecurity department cared a lot about account takeover attacks. If somebody, the wrong person logged into an account, a customer account, they would care, but the fraud department did not care until they started doing transactions. Then they would get involved. So the fraud department is not watching the exchange of other types of business data um, between organizations. Uh, and businesses tend to trust the data that they get from other departments. I don't know, it, you know, it arrives as a batch job overnight, we just use it. We don't, you know, they don't choose to distrust that data and check it. Um, so they will just take whatever they receive. And of course, the big data trend does not necessarily include inventory. Collect it all, let God sort it out. Um, you know, that they're not really thinking about this, which is why I say, thank goodness for GDPR. <laughs> yes, I really did say that. And why? Because it's making businesses finally look at what they have, why they have it, and whether they can possibly get rid of it. Uh, so this is, this is a very important change, and I hope it spreads further because it's not nearly enough to address this, but it is a, a really good start. Now, another type of integrity or, or denial of trust attack is in malicious design of user interfaces and apps, or what they call dark patterns. Here's an example of a dark pattern. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but um, they designed a smudge into the phone app so that you would think it was dirt on your screen and you would click on it. And of course, since they monetize clicks, they, they would get a whole bunch of clicks. It's fiendishly clever. And, you know, and sitting there going click, 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 click on your phone. Um, so this is, you know, th th this is, yeah, it's appalling. It's really, it's really amazing. Uh, but there are many other types of, uh, of dark patterns as well. Uh, here's, a, here's a great one. There's a great site called darkpatterns.org where you can read about these, but some of them are uh, bait and switch where you think you are saying yes to one thing, but you're actually saying yes to a bunch of other things in a workflow. Uh, confirm shaming. If you've, you know, when you buy a plane ticket and they ask you whether you want to buy travel insurance and you have to answer yes or no, and it says, uh, yes, I choose not to protect my very valuable investment. That sort of confirmed shame. Yes, I want to let the orphans starve. Uh, that sort of manipulation. 
Uh, misdirection. There was another case uh, with one airline where uh, they led you to believe that you could not get a, a seat assigned without paying five pounds, and you had to. Um, and you know the check mark for that was very big. What they didn't show is that you could actually X out of it at a very small part of the screen, and then you could go choose your seat for free. So, um, you know, misdirection, making you look at the wrong thing, and then trick questions, things you know phrased in a way: Would you like to not cancel the thing that you didn't want to do? Wait, what? Uh, so that people really don't understand how to do these things. Um, one of, and we are sort of we are acclimated to do, to follow certain workflows, to follow certain procedures by certain types of user interface. Um, an, a, another thing is abuse of intuitive UI things like colors. Um, in, in a lot of the Western world, red means danger. Green means things are okay. If you color something red, they're less likely to click on it because they think it means danger. The uh, tick boxes, you're used to thinking of tick boxes as, as something where you could maybe choose multiple ones, but radio buttons, you can only choose one option. If they play with that, you're not sure what you can choose and how much of it. Uh, timeouts, how many people walk around in a perpetual state of low-level anxiety because you're not sure if you are using your phone's battery too fast? That, yeah, you're sitting there going, well, maybe I shouldn't look at it right now because I have a long day to go, and the, the third, yeah, there's no, we, we're all slaves to the wall. We're all slaves to the power outlet. Uh, so creating artificial scarcity by, set, by means of session timeouts or saying there's only one ticket left, hurry, there's only one room left, will drive you to make decisions in a hurry that are not necessarily uh, in your best interest. Um, the problem with malicious design is that it is not a backdoor, it's not additional code. It's only something that, oh wow, my vodka's here, thank you. <laughs> or is that gin? Not sure. Uh, it's England, it's gin, okay. Um, so the, um, so if you are a designer, uh, a lot of designers can, can examine this code and go, oh, you can see where they created that smudge and we know why they're doing it. But otherwise, we have so many bad user interfaces, so many engineering grade UI designs that we're used to being confused and, uh, and, and not doing things properly so that they can take advantage of that. So it would take a designer to look at a UI and say, you know, this is so bad it must have been on purpose. They must have a nefarious reason for doing this. When my, uh, when my oldest was about two or three, before he could even read, we used to let him click around at a child's you know, site on the internet. And we caught him one day in the middle of downloading and installing a plugin. And we figured out that what had happened was he had become habituated to figuring out when a pop-up came up and it had two boxes. And one of them was outlined darker than the other one because that was the default choice. If he clicked on that one, it would make the pop-up go away and he could go back to doing what he was doing. So he got used to clicking on the highlighted default until he got to the EULA of this plugin, it decline accept, and there was no default choice, so he didn't know what to do. And that's where we found him, stuck. So <laughs> even, even our kids are being habituated to certain user interface designs. We all are. And this is something that someone can take advantage of um, and cause us not to trust the things that we really should be trusting. Uh, on top of that, we really can't trust ourselves. First of all, there's bias in all sorts of things, algorithmic bias. We are doing all sorts of machine learning using data that has historically been tainted by bias that we're not realizing. And in fact, uh, Amit Elazari, who has done a lot of work in, in legal language for bug bounty programs, is now proposing a bug bounty program for bias in algorithms. So to encourage people to look through algorithms, find the bias and report it so that we can clean those things up. I think that's a great idea. The other thing is incapability. We are not really that good at, um, at any, well, at anything. <laughs> at least I'm not, you know. We're, we're very good at being wrong. Um, this is a great interview by Tripwire of Damon Cortesi, who was a, an application security expert, 
and he talks about how he uh, became a developer and, and you know started writing his own tool. And he had to go through and get it functional first, and then when he went back to review it with his security hat on, he found all sorts of security flaws in it uh, that he already knew about but couldn't help writing in. And I believe that we, are, as humans, are not capable of holding those two states in our head at the same time, of both creating something to make it function and checking it from a security perspective. So we're, we're just not good at this. Um, Here's another really great example of data corruption. Um, Rafael Sater, who is uh, a, an Associated Press journalist, told me this story last week. His father, uh, David Sater, was targeted by Cyber Berkut. Um, David Sater was working together with um, Radio Liberty, um, a, a uh, uh, Russian-based free speech organization. And uh, this organization, Cyber Bear, could leaked his email messages but altered them to make it look as if he was a CIA influencer. Now, luckily, David was, was lucky in that he had a son who understood cybersecurity. Uh, he had the original emails so he could compare them to the altered emails and try to figure out what was changed. But here's an example of what was changed. Uh, for example, they took out the things that were crossed out in red. Um, this very specific Radio Liberty, Liberty Russian investigative reporting project is gaining traction. If you take it out, it looks like it's a much larger, more general, pervasive project. So Russian investigative reporting project could be anything and everything. The subtlety, the meaning of that, made it look like, yes, we are trying to corrupt everything. And the thing is that, um, that Citizen Lab helped do this, um, this investigation and they came back to Raphael and David and said, you know, you missed a few things when you were comparing the emails. And uh, there were some things that were so subtle that they just didn't notice. And again, I theorized that what they were doing was they were checking for word alteration or text alteration, lengths of words, punctuation, and so on, what you do in copy editing when you're not reading for meaning. So again, they missed the fact that things were deleted so as to have a very subtle effect of implying something very different. And again, we're not good at holding these two states in our head. You can either do one or the other. So if you're, imagine if you are the author of these emails and you have them in front of you and you're comparing them line by line and you still cannot get, um, excuse me, that, geez, that's my phone. Um, nobody ever calls me. What's going on? That must be the Associated Press. Um, so if, if even you can't do this, um, with your own emails, imagine how hard it will be for an organization to detect this sort of, of alteration in documents and go through it line by line and figure out what's been changed. Imagine, uh, instead of ransomware, an extortion um, notification that says, I have the ability to change your business data in a way you can't detect at a time that you can't detect. Uh, I've already done it. For this amount of money, I will tell you where it is and what's been changed. So that's, that's pretty scary stuff. So how could we defend against that sort of attack? We need to be able to trust ourselves, first of all, and we need to be able to earn trust from others. Uh, here are some of the ways that I think that, we, that one earns trust through honesty, obviously telling, telling the truth, transparency, telling the whole truth, telling the details. And this is a problem we have with breach notifications today, where you don't want to tell the, all the gory details about how you got breached. And yet those are, those are the details in threat intelligence that are the most important. This is exactly what we did. This is what they did. This is how we re responded. This is, as soon as they saw us responding, this is what they changed. That sort of detail in the form of a story is really invaluable, but that's what tends to get taken out. Predictability. Can you, um, can you trust someone to follow, um, if either uh, to follow their own interests if you know what their interests are? Can you, you know, trust them to stick to their interests? Can you trust them not to go back on their word? Uh, or make up something and then make up another lie immediately afterwards. <laughs> um, they have to have the capability as well, because if you have the best intentions in the world, if you cannot 
follow through on what you've committed to, you know, then you still can't be trusted. The willingness to correct mistakes is the, a, a really critical thing. The, the ability to say, yes, we were wrong, we're going to fix this now, it's going to stay fixed. And then finally, accountability. We always feel better about trusting somebody if we know that there's a, a, an external entity holding them to account instead of just, well, you know, we have to rely on their, their goodwill you know, to, to do something. So remember trustworthy computing uh, from Microsoft when Bill Gates wrote the memo and built the trustworthy computing uh, department. By the way, all those people have since been um, distributed now uh, into other departments. But that was all about making sure that the software and the operating system was not, you know, was not altered or not alterable in, in ways that would compromise the security, but it didn't address the issue of changing data. So we need a new model for trustworthy computing that also includes data integrity. We really have been very good on confidentiality and on availability, but it's that I that we're not really doing yet. The issue, though, is that trust is neither binary nor permanent. It depends on what you trust them to do. I trust my husband uh, to run our internal infrastructure. I do not trust him to cook. <laughs> so, um, you know, what do you trust? Uh, you know, you never give global trust to anything for any reason. What conditions need to be true? And this is all about how you create your, your security policy. Uh, what conditions need to be true for you to trust this device, this user, this application? In what context and for how long? What changes need to be happen in the environment for you to decide, okay, that trust has timed out and now I need to re-verify? Uh, this is also something that CISOs spend a lot of time on. Maybe not, uh, maybe not consciously, but when they're creating you know, the, these risk management policies, they're often thinking about how long can I trust this thing? So let me ask you this, what happens to a community without trust? And what happens to a society without trust? We are so reliant on our digital world now, our digital infrastructure, if we can't trust it, what's going to happen to us? What happens in the security community when we can't trust one another? Because we're finding that uh, in a lot of cases we cannot solve these problems without trust. If we are not exchanging the right kind of threat intelligence, we cannot trust each other. Um, so I don't know if people remember Cydragon, Chris Roberts, the guy who claimed to have hacked the plane in flight and made it fly sideways and everything. He trusted me a little too much uh, with his unlocked phone in a bar. And so I posted this on Twitter just to remind him that you really shouldn't trust anybody, including middle-aged former state bureaucrats. Um, but, uh, but seriously, though, um, in, in the security community, we hack each other all the time. It makes it very difficult for practitioners to come up here and say, we've built something really good. We think it is working, because that's like going, pull, <laughs> and everybody will, will be on it. And if we cannot change that attitude, even inside of the security community, we won't have the level of trust that we need in order to do this. Um, so again, if we were to build systems that had these qualities, that embodied you know, honesty, transparency, understanding, being, for everybody being able to verify for themselves what their apps are doing on their phone, what they're getting access to and why and when, and explaining in language they can actually understand, um, being able to correct these mistakes and so on, what would this look like? I think from um, a very high level point of view, our, our systems need to have preventive measures in place, well understood processes so that everyone can understand how they work and, and the protection of data. The detection, we need better visibility and control over those changes, over all sorts of changes. But most of all, and this is why I said no blockchain, we need the ability to correct things at any time and correct them in a reliable and trustworthy manner. Yes, this data used to say X, it was wrong, we need to change it to Y. How can you trust us to know, you know that this is a valid change, a valid correction, and now things are gonna get better instead of worse? I think this is where we are not addressing things either in terms of security products or in terms of security technology, being able to do this um, 
in a trustworthy manner. Because the problem is, yes, we have a lot of things that we can do, like continuous authentication. Can you keep trusting this user? And how long? And when do you stop trusting them? We can do data validation to a certain extent. Uh, we need more transparency, but we can do that. Accountability, um, you know, regulations, sorry, but ac accountability tends to make people trust more. What we cannot do is hash all the things. And I'm sorry, hash is very tasty, but we cannot hash all the data. Business data is too dynamic for us to be able to do this, you know, at any given time. Plus, you need to be able to reissue um, new and, and uh, assurance of data integrity every time you make a, a needed correction. So, you know, again, we need a, we need a better answer to that. Here's another thing that as I was think, building this talk that I, I thought about, and I'm not sure if this is right or not because I'm very good at being wrong, but I think that trustworthy data and systems cannot be separated from trustworthy people. I don't think it is possible to build a trustworthy system that remains trustworthy regardless of who uses it, regardless of the capability and the intentions of the people that use it. Again, I'm, uh, it would be great if I were proven wrong on this, but I, I just have this feeling. So this is, uh, I, I never know how to end these things. So um, I'm just going to um, emphasize that what we really need to do is step away from the hoodies, um, and, you know, get to the point where we can trust people and not, you know, care so much about trusting them based on what they wear. And uh, I think we are out of time. We're out of time. We, we have time for two questions. Okay, we can let you have two questions. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, and w one thing that, um, uh, especially when we're looking at it from a, a UX point of view, um, there's, there's this idea that now it's quite fashionable to attack the myth of, oh, the user is the weakest link, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think that a lot of that is true in the sense that I think really users have been kind of been made, you know, like uh, the, the uh, the ba the burden has been put onto the user. Like, they have to spot everything. They have to. Yeah. They're the ones. They're ultimately responsible for terrible UX and terrible implementation by developers and designers. So, like, what's your opinion on like how do we shift the the burden onto developers um, and to um, UI designers to you know ensure like a good ex a good security experience for users? Yeah. Um, you know, it used to be when I started in this about 30 years ago. Uh, it was a very small pool of technical people, and they all um, w th we, we all had pretty much the same level of knowledge, so you could describe something as intuitively obvious because you could all understand it the same way. Those days are long gone. We are developing for the rest of the world, uh, our children, our parents, you know everything. Um, so yeah, we do need to change that mindset that, well, you know, I built it and I understood it, therefore you should be able to understand it too. Um, we do have to work at that. I think one of the worst things that we ever did was to tell people, was to use the free and, and, and freely available and cheap human memory for primary credential storage uh, because passwords are, you know, back when you only had one system and you only had one password, that was all right. But now it is simply untenable and we should never have told users not to write things down because that led to reusing passwords and, and you know, memorable passwords. Uh, we used a very flawed mechanism, and we need to fix that and many other things. Another question? I think we... Sorry, thank you for the talk. One of the things that gets me about this trust issue is we're often not trusting the people we've spent a great deal of money on trusting. So part of my job is actually delivering a system that will essentially work out what our users are doing mm -hmm. and I do wonder if we have gone through all that we don't have to hash every single message but do we need to hash enough do we need to record enough to give us a sample of what's happening 
Yeah, I mean, in, I mean, in cases... It doesn't have to be everything, does it? Uh, I, I think so. Uh, I mean, certainly in cases where hashing makes sense and where, you know, we can say, yes, something is intended to be static, it's created once, it generally doesn't need correction, but if it does, we might correct it a total of once. Um, if you're doing defensive measures, you know, if you're doing things like canaries in your documents because you don't trust anybody, um, you know, that you're giving this to and you want to see, you know, who's, who's uh, distributing it, um, you know, all of those have their places, but I think overall, um, yeah, we need to be able to determine the difference between users that are actively being uh, malicious and those that, that are just not understanding, you know, the mess that we gave them to, to run and understanding, you know. The other thing is that we, you know, I disagree with the idea of scaring our users. Um, if they make a mistake, and they will, and they do all the time, they need to be able to come to you and report it immediately. Um, I know some people who believe that you know, phishing response isn't necessarily preventing it, but responding fast enough, uh, because it is going to happen. Um, so I think all these things have a place uh, at the table, and, but w I think we need, really need to think more about wh where can we build in trust so that we don't have to punish the, uh, you know, the fallible people using it. Anything else? I, I think it's great that you concentrated on integrity for a while because that, that's just not done enough. And in the transport sector, it's, it's really that's the thing that would worries me the most. Um, where would you put? Because one, one of the things that also worries me is that we don't we don't sort of methodologically look at delay in a system. So something that might slow a system down, but that could have enormous uh, impact. And I just would you put that under integrity, or is that something that you would you would try and capture differently and, and think about as a uh, yeah, I don't. I, I, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I, I think it. You could look at it in, in different ways, and whichever way leads you to the answer is the way you should be looking at it. Uh, I don't know. You know, especially in, in avionics. Um, you know, as uh, Dan Glass, who's the CISO of American Airlines, says, "Fail fast does not work when you're on one of my planes." So, um, yeah, th there are some things where you, you cannot afford failure. You cannot afford alteration. And those sort of safety issues, you know, obviously belong in much higher discipline environments. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. The, yeah, the end result is I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you again. Thanks to Wendy for sufficiently scaring us, but also providing some reassuring ways that we can continue to build trust. Um, next, we're going to have uh, our panel, and this is actually quite timely because I know uh, a lot of these topics have been mentioned earlier in the day, uh, so now we're going to have some great experts who will be able to talk uh, about each one of them in depth. Uh, this panel is called Securing the Unsecurable. Uh, so we are going to have an expert in blockchain, big data, IoT, and an ethical hacker discuss the kind of <laughs> risks that come along with new developing technologies. So new technologies are developing all the time, and often they're pushed to market without security having been considered as part of their creation. So we're going to have some experts discuss the vulnerabilities and risks uh, that you find in them and kind of ways to mitigate them uh, in the future. So Chris will be chairing the panel and introducing the panelists. Um, and uh, afterwards, we will open the floor to questions. Thanks for the introduction. As Carl said, I will be chairing the panel, securing the unsecurable, and I have four experts with me today. To introduce them, I have Amber Balde, Amber Led. Sorry, <laughs> just got this one written down. Don't worry about it. We tricked you. Do you want me to, I can. No, it doesn't matter at all. <laughs> we have Zoe Rose, a cybersecurity consultant at Beringa and self-identified ethical hacker. We have Stephanie Edwards, security researcher and consultant at NWR Info Security, and our resident expert on IoT. We have Amber Balde. Um, she led JP Morgan's Blockchain Center of Excellence since its, since its inception and recently left for her new venture, Clover. And finally, we have Ade Adewumi. She works for Teradata, working at the intersection of data, digital, and strategy with an emphasis on big data. Okay. 
So as we've already mentioned, each of the panellists has different expertise that they bring to this panel. It'd be great if each of you could give a quick introduction to this as we start. So if we have Zoe telling us a bit about what an ethical hacker actually does, <laughs> Steph talking us through Internet of Things, Amber, an introduction to blockchain, and Ade introduce us to big data. Okay, so ethical hacker, I get that a lot, what the heck is that? Um, but essentially I like to break it in half, so hacker, break things, uh, figure out, it's like a mindset, you think of instead of what something meant to do, you say what can I make it do uh, for me? Add the ethical part in there, which is quite critical, um, and it means I would never do that without permission, um, and my end goal is always breaking something to educate or to make something more secure. Ben? Okay. <laughs> so, I think everyone has an IoT device, everyone kind of knows what it is at that level, but um, to break it down, so the concept of a thing in this case is a physical object or a device um, that's embedded with electronics, software and sensors, and the point of those is to enable the device to gather information about its internal, external environments, um, send and receive data over the internet, um, and to perform actions on the device as a result of data analytics. And then Internet of Things, the connected network of all of those things. Yeah, so after Wendy said, don't say blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. My job is literally to just say blockchain a thousand times a day. Uh, that's cool. Um, so, I, I mean, I think she's right about pretty much all the things, and we really shouldn't say blockchain so frequently. Uh, and most of the time, there's a huge difference between what blockchain actually means at a technical level, which is a pretty specific sort of Merkle hashing structure data tree, um, and uh, a way to coordinate and come to consensus across a bunch of people that may or may not trust each other or know who each other are, uh, and what people mean when they say blockchain now, which is like this kind of decentralized, trust agnostic, like global internet of money. Um, and those are very, very different things. Um, but uh, there's, there are, there's a huge difference, there's a huge utility for bringing concepts that have existed for 30 years, like uh, distributed systems computing, um, and like having a basic you know, a, a cryptographic log of stuff that happened um, into businesses that haven't had that before. So um, very different between the way that enterprises are thinking about this technology versus what's happening out in like crazy Bitcoin land. Um, big data is a bit of a vague term, uh, but it essentially describes data that is so voluminous that its um, traditional data processing applications don't really aren't really able to to draw value from. Now that means that it introduces challenges around how that data is collected, how it's stored, how it's accessed, how it's queried. But on the and to do so in a in a privacy um, respecting and security respecting way, um, and then on the other hand, though the reason why it's worth the trouble is the value of the insights that can be gleaned. So the the opportunities that are presented in the form of just large scale automation, because you can start to see patterns that human beings aren't just very good at spotting. Brilliant. Thanks for that. So I have some questions for you all, as you know, and I'm going to go to one individual for your thoughts first, and then all of you feel free to chip in. So I'm going to direct the first one at you, Steph. This is a pretty vague one to start with. So generally, where do you see the Internet of Things going? Um, so it's definitely going to keep growing. Um, it's been growing for a while. Um, but I think we're kind of past a bit of an experimental phase now where we've had a kind of massive influx of IoT gadgets and people and businesses are getting a lot of benefit out of it. Um, so I think we're going to see it mature, so kind of key advancements in the industrial and medical sectors, but that will be a lot more gradual kind of as opposed to the consumer sector because it requires kind of a lot of work on security. Um, but I think... Um, also, in terms of that kind of IoT scaling, we're just going to see a massive kind of increase, as we are already, in the amount of data being generated and flowing through IoT networks. Um, so I think we're going to see infrastructure and policy change to handle that. Brilliant. Okay, so off the back of this, what about the economics of collecting and processing? Do you think we are just being overwhelmed by new and exciting tech? Will we soon realise that maybe our fridge doesn't need to tell us that we're running out of milk? Adam, would you like to... Um, yeah, I think um, 
So in my, in my job, my role is to advise companies on, on how they use big data. Um, and I think one of the things that I find often is even internally trying to make the case for why you would do this is quite hard. And that's because the costs of of collecting and processing is hard to gauge, partly because we haven't been doing it long enough to, to be able to have enough reference data to know that kind of stuff. But also because um, when you think about it, a lot of the, the data, whether it's via IoT devices or whether it's, as is often the case with the organizations I work with, via services, business services, these services weren't designed or optimized for collecting data that was going to be used for the purposes of analytics. And that means um, the data is often of insufficiently high quality. There's a reason that so many data scientists, I think uh, a reasonable estimate is about, what, 60% of a data scientist's time is just in data preparation, which if you think about how much data scientists cost, um, is a huge waste. Um, but also, these services and transactional, transactional services don't collect data, don't collect metadata, which is another thing that data scientists need in order to be able to, to build models that are making sensible inferences. Um, we're just not optimized for these sorts of things. Ditto processing. So I think we're, we're getting past the point where everyone thought the answer was just to throw it in the cloud because, you know, that's just infinite. Um, and the reality is we're finding that, especially if we want to start drawing these insights in real time, that the cost of retrieval is not trivial. Now, all of these things start to impact, and I don't think, I think as technologists, actually, um, and I've primarily works in technology, and one of the things that's really interesting is the intersection with business is to start justifying the cost. Now, I work with data scientists and engineers who are super excited just about the technology, um, and it's always an interesting meeting when you run up against the business person who's like, yeah, that's really interesting. And how much is that going to cost? Um, and because we don't think about the economics of it, we, we aren't investing enough in the kind of analytic ops that means that we can do this intelligently. So data flows, how the data flows through an organization, how it gets used, are the sorts of things that we need to start thinking about from an organizational standpoint anyway. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, yeah, that was, that was really good. Okay, let's try and tie it into a few more things. This might upset some people in the audience here. So blockchain is most commonly known for its application to cryptocurrencies, but could be applied to any industry. Could we discuss its implications for the use and sharing of big data? Sure. Uh, yeah, so what, out in the public space, what people are usually thinking about, or the, the real revolution that got people excited, is this idea of um, crypt cryptographically unique digital bearer assets. Uh, and that just means something that when it's gone from you, it's like really gone, but it actually had value. Uh, so, you know, with our Internet of Information, you know, you, you have a picture and you email it to somebody, and now you have two of those pictures, which is great for pictures, but really bad for things like money or um, votes or intellectual property rights. Now, that said, anything that's tied to an identity or should be singular to a human, something like a vote, should absolutely not be put on a blockchain. Um, so there's, there's a, yeah, that's a different discussion. Um, but what, when it comes to big data, uh, we have an interesting opportunity to rethink the relationship that we have um, with where, uh, where data resides um, and how it is accessed. So people are very excited about the ability to possibly decentralize some of these very central um, data aggregators. Uh, which we were talking about actually before the, the panel a little bit, because um, there could be very, very interesting implications if you were able to, say, hold some of your own data personally um, and, A, maybe lease some of that out, or, B, keep it more private to you, while allowing businesses who need that information to derive the same sort of business value uh, analytics. So um, can you do AI and machine learning on a blockchain? No. Like, do not do that. Um, it's not going to happen, at least, at least not right now. But there are certainly projects that are looking at doing things of, around um, machine learning of decentralized data sets uh, that could be very, very transformative. The problem is that it's, it's so early that anybody that talks about doing this in a meaningful way is almost definitely lying to you. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah I'll bear that in mind. <laughs> so since this is a panel about securing the unsecurable, it'd be good to come on to some of the security challenges facing these emerging techs. Mm -hmm. Steph, would you like to start us off maybe the three key challenges you think face IoT? Three key security challenges or just challenges? Security? 
Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Okay, um, so the first one that I can think of is just that the attack surface is absolutely massive. So instead of just having kind of the device, you've got to think about um, mobile, like the controller application, and then the entire supporting infrastructure, so the big kind of infinite cloud. Um, and yeah, and then on top of that, IoT is really, really different kind of in each sector. So you can't kind of consider security kind of in IoT in, say, like the automotive sector, and then that will kind of apply to like the healthcare sector. That just doesn't work. Um, so that makes security in the IoT space really, really hard. Um, another thing I think is kind of classic one has been, um, especially with the IoT gadgets, is kind of rush to market. Um, so vendors are kind of trying to get cheap um, products out there really fast. And to them, security kind of isn't worth the time or added expense. Um, compared to the profit they're making from just getting it out there. Um, and also, the third one, probably, um, I think, is just generally the consumer. So as a consumer, it's got to be really, really difficult to differentiate between kind of what is essentially a marketing campaign and what actually is solid security. So, um, yeah, and that isn't really... And a lot of the time, if you're a consumer and you're buying an IoT product, you're not necessarily going to consider security. You just think it looks really cool. And that's not necessarily because... You don't care about security, but you just don't really need that. Know that you need to. Yeah, I saw a, a major consultancy that has one of those kind of innovation labs. You get to tour when you go uh, hang out with them, and they had an actual light bulb that bought its own energy from the open market in Bitcoin um, every every 15 minutes. So uh, when it was running out of power, you could kind of watch it dim, and then it would go out and post this transaction. And then you kind of sat in the dark for 10 minutes while it mined, which was maybe not so great. But then the light bulb would go back on. Um, and it was at that point I realized, as the light bulb went out, like a literal metaphor for my a literal metaphor for what was happening here. Like, wow, as if the Internet of Things wasn't uh, enough of a, a terrifying uh, topology uh, for or attack surface here. Now we're going to have these devices talking to each other and apparently have autonomous self-executing contracts that have monetary value attached to them. And now your refrigerator is mining Bitcoin, and like <laughs> everything is a disaster. Um, so I, I think uh, we have this opportunity, though, if we were more engaged uh, with the information security community from the beginning to perhaps uh, do a slightly better job than we have done with, uh, with IoT since we saw we can learn from what happened there. And as much as people say, you know, I guess one of the jokes is, you know, the cloud is uh, just somebody else's computer, but the blockchain is just all of our computers. Um, that, you know, there was a long time when security people were like, oh, cloud security is like crap. Like, I don't care about that. That's not real. It doesn't matter. Um, but businesses have moved there, and there are certainly now jobs that are cloud security specialists. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just a different way to think about how our data is stored. So we can choose whether or not we just snark about it, or we can admit that whether we do anything or not, IBM is definitely selling this stuff. Um, and, and I think people, people are definitely going to be installing it, and we're, we better secure it. Yeah. IBM, I read, are doing kind of their Watson IoT platform integrated with IBM blockchain, so yeah, I, I don't it. know how that Absolutely. might work. So what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> okay, brilliant. So let's look at it from a different angle. So Zoe, what is the motivation for actually embedding security in these things? Well, two things. Actually, what... Before I say that, the first thing I thought of um, uh, as you're talking was the do you actually need it bit? Um, and because if you take it and you don't maintain it, you're actually creating, creating a more insecure environment. So I've seen organizations that have like um, faucets for coffee and it's brilliant but they don't ever patch that. Um, and nobody wants to be hacked because their coffee s system's unpatched. How embarrassing would that be? Um, and I've also seen it where um, malicious actors, because we're so used to it everywhere, uh, they'll implant it in your house and you'll never notice. Um, and I've seen it in a case where um, somebody was stalking someone and put a camera in their home, and they had no idea it was there. And the benefit of it being very insecure is we could find out who put it there. The downside is it was there for a very long time before they noticed. Um, and going into the why do they want to make it secure, um, don't really have a reason. I mean, if you think about it, uh, when you go out and you want to buy something off Amazon, example, uh, you'll probably buy within a price range. 
you know, you want it to do this, this, and this, these features, and you only want to spend this much. And um, so when I go and buy ferret toys, for example, um, I have a ferret, um, I go and I buy him a bulk of toys because I know he's going to break it. Um, and he's going to destroy them, so I just get him a lot. It's typically not super expensive. It's the same with if I want really cool things in my house, I might spend, this is my budget, I want all of these things. So there isn't really a motivation because, as you said, getting it to market is so important. However, with things like GDPR, um, privacy and security by design, um, that does help a little bit, uh, even if they're not necessarily in scope yet. Um, the thing you want to think about is because in GDPR uh, it's making the directors uh, liable, um, that actually has a bigger impact because it's going to make people rethink how they approach security because obviously they're personally liable now. They need to care about it. Um, and because of that, they'll actually change the processes of how they're doing things. So I think in time, in the future, that will be bigger. But at the moment, there isn't a huge amount motivating you to actually care about security um, because of the misconception that security by design, privacy by design, is expensive. It doesn't have to be. Um, embedding it in your processes is what's actually going to make it more cost effective versus, I think somebody said earlier of how if you do all of this work, it was the open banking one actually, you do all this work, everything's good, and then you say, okay, well, um, can you do an ethical hack? And I say, actually, let's re-architect your entire design. You're not going to do that. And that's where I think the problem actually lies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how, how do you feel about that? Do you think that security is being prioritized enough? No. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, like. I, think, I think it depends on the vendor. So, for example, and just as a general security, security tip, I would say, like, looking at an IoT device, just research the vendor before you buy. Because if they're a large vendor, say, like, an, um, like Amazon or Google or something, um, then they're probably going, one, they're going to have the resources to do security, and two, they're going to care about it a bit more because it's reputationally damaging if they don't. But if you go buy kind of a... I don't know, five pound webcam or something, or like a three pound doorbell, wireless doorbell, then they, they're just not going to have put the time and resources into securing that. So there definitely is a, a kind of, there's definitely kind of different levels of security versus kind of like use case. But um, yeah, it depends what you want, I think. But I think, for example, people buying an Amazon, um, like Echo, um, probably are, are just buying it because they think it's cool. And then when they hear, I'm just going to do a shameless shout out to my company, but a teammate found um, a zero day in the Echo last year. And I think that was kind of a bit, oh, like we bought this and we kind of didn't really realize that this could be hacked and then be a backdoor into our home network. So I think the more stories about that that get out there, the more that people will actually care about it. I think the, the blockchain hype has been awesome for opening communication channels with C-suite again about privacy by design and about strong encryption. Um, and I have gotten to, uh, somewhat to my surprise, describe like relatively complex cryptographic concepts to people who previously definitely would not have asked these questions um, because they heard that like the blockchain was going to fix things. And you know, no, your problem isn't actually a blockchain problem. Like maybe you wanted a bloom filter, but they're asking the questions and they they understand that there's tools out there that they could be using better. Um, and so in realizing that you know, as some of this stuff does move forward, if, if we are doing something as boring as creating a more mutualized infrastructure, and maybe it is a distributed database, but with different sort of access model controls, but if we have the opportunity to re-architect that uh, in a way that does treat privacy by design um, in a more rigorous way, and does learn from some of the insecurity and the, the perimeter-based security model that we've had for the last 30 years, which has proven to be laughably flawed, um, that if we're thinking through that in a, in a new way, it's absolutely an opportunity to ratchet up security in a, in a really meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Okay, Adam, moving on to you then. How, another really vague question here. So looking at data breaches, as yeah. we talk about data here, we've had some pretty bad ones over the past few years. Facebook and Cambridge Analytica made the news absolutely everywhere. Just a recent scandal, they're popping up all of the time. What do you think we should be doing to avoid things like this in the future? 
I'm so glad you asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think, again, like, you know, we, are, we aren't um, single-issue individuals, and so it's impossible to have, like, single-issue kind of solutions to security. It's a multifaceted problem. Um, but one of the, the things that I found really interesting on the back of the Facebook Cambridge Analytica um, uh, situation was the number of people, especially those actually who work in tech, who were upset because they knew they should be upset, um, <laughs> but didn't quite know what to do about it. It's kind of like, you know, and, and who couldn't explain what the problem really was. So there was a, you know, yeah, something dodgy's happened, which is annoying. Um, and I was always suspicious of, you know, some of that campaigning going on. Um, yeah, someone should do something. Um, and, and, and there's, a, there's something bad that has happened. That was pretty much the extent of the, the discussion, right? Um, but that's because it was a business model, not a data breach. Well, yes, but also because I think if you're building technology in this space, then you hopefully begin to recognize that you are, and it doesn't matter what you're doing, actually, that you're a small player in a much bigger ecosystem. And that dealing with the complexity of not just the things you do, um, but also the things that others in your supply chain might do or is really difficult to assess. And if you're building technology in that space, it's hard. And there aren't enough tools. So we've talked a lot about how we can educate consumers and how consumers can start to think about or make, you know, discriminate between different um, vendors when they go buy stuff. But actually, the same is true for technologists as well. As in, how do I start to, to what are the patterns that I need to be able to follow? Because if I'm doing my day job and I'm paid to do this specific thing, thinking about how my, my bit of the world interacts with all the others is beyond me. Right, so there's there's that. The other thing in Wendy's talk earlier, she mentioned GDPR, um, and I did a little clap internally because it wasn't cool to do it in the middle of <laughs> uh, the chat. But um, again, because of what it starts to make us do, in that it starts to make us be right, rightly concerned about data flows and about data usage. So one of the biggest things that I think scared organizations with the emergence of GDPR was just finding the data. Like I don't know anyone who's lit, who works in an organization that's been around for more than a couple of years who doesn't have and isn't aware of a vibrant shadow data economy within their organization, right? Um, and some of that is because you know legacy systems are hard to get data out of and into, but also because human beings need workarounds because security is so badly implemented most of the time. Um, so how we start to think about that is really important. But the, the thing I'm, I'm hoping, so I'm excited about GDPR now just because it's forcing some of these discussions. Mm -hmm. But what I'm hoping starts to emerge soon is because GDPR is focused very much on, on the data for the individual. And a lot of the Cambridge Analytica Facebook um, scandal was focused again on what um, too much, I thought, on individuals' data. But actually, the, the, the real danger it exposed was the power in relationships. Mm -hmm. So data is very rarely, um, and, be, and you know, we're, we're shifting paradigms here, which is, and we as a society, as people, need to catch up. But this idea of actually your personal data, my date of birth, where I live and stuff, is interesting and useful. But what's just as interesting and powerful is who I speak to who I regularly engage with, what information you can infer on the basis of those relationships. And that was what, surprisingly, wasn't touched on, I thought, sufficiently. And that's where I'm hoping GDPR is going to start moving to soon. Yeah, I agree, because with the Cambridge Analytica thing, it wasn't the fact that it was individuals, information that was found out, it was as a collective, yeah. the data was incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've looked at some of the challenges facing these tech. Could you... So could you start us off talking about some of the consequences of mm -hmm. these challenges and security issues? Yeah, I mean, the consequences are, you can imagine, they're, they're quite detrimental in some cases. Sometimes you might think, oh, actually, that isn't a big deal. Like, yes, I got a lot of people telling me, Cambridge Analytica, they're like, yeah, but my data isn't that valuable. I mean, it doesn't really matter that much. And so it did bring up the relationship thing. So there's somebody agreeing with you, don't worry. <laughs> and, it was, um, and, and it was, from my point of view, it was, I think, because it's in the media a lot. People are starting to get it, so eventually there'll be people clapping with you, don't worry. Um, but I think the consequences I like to say to people, so I speak to a lot of developers, um, how to embed security, and um, they don't understand the concept of um, 
Something you do right now may have a much bigger impact to somebody else. And I like to bring up the example of Grindr. So Grindr is an app that helps gay men date. Um, obviously a needed app, it's a dating app, not a big deal. But because of the way it was designed, uh, people did use it um, maliciously and it actually caused very detrimental things to a lot of men. Um, things like in the US it was used to target a man in his home, in Cairo it was used to target um, men that use it, not necessarily that they're gay specific, well that was the reason, but um, they used it to use to find other excuses. And so that's a really good example, sorry I move a lot, that's a really good example of how something very small and how you but something very small in how you're um, creating an app that people are going to use, and obviously it's for a good reason, can have very, very big consequences down to you know people's lives. Um, look at people that maybe don't want to be um, well known, uh, being somebody that has dealt with abuse in the past. Um, I would not be okay if all of the apps I was doing give that gave that abuser my. I, my location. I mean, that would be terrifying. And there's a lot of people that go through that every day using the apps, using stuff that's collecting their data, um, using IoT, probably using blockchain because it sounds awesome. <laughs> I'm sure it is too. But um, they don't realize, they, on their own, they don't realize the consequences. They're not experts. And um, we, as the people creating this or implementing these technologies, we have to realize that we're taking temporary ownership of somebody's intimate life details. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know what exactly you want for the consequences, but I, in my opinion, the consequences are if you think about it, um, potentially you cause, could cause um, somebody's, it's, you can impact somebody's life very negatively by not thinking about the interaction, not thinking about what happens if somebody takes what I did and uses it maliciously. That yeah, sense. yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> Sorry, just to add on, on that, so it reminds me of a, um, a talk that Mache Sikowski did about thinking about data, personal data, but data more generally, as toxic waste. Mm. Um, so in Wendy's talk, she mentioned um, that GDPR was getting organisations to start thinking about what data they needed to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And in the, you know, when there was so much more hype about um, the opportunities of big data, um, one of the things organisations got into the habit of doing was just indiscriminate data collection. Um, without thinking through what the business needs were or anything else. Now, we are starting to get to the point where storage is becoming enough of an issue that organizations are genuinely now starting to, to be concerned about what they do with this. And if you think, again, IoT um, is generating so much data, and given that so much of the analytics we want to do on this data, which is the excuse for collecting it in the first place, um, uh, you're looking for patterns, and a lot of the IoT, a lot of data that's generated by IoT devices doesn't change that much, um, and so it's not useful in that way for for patterns, for identifying patterns in the data, and so beginning to think about why you're collecting this information in the first place. But again, we're not organizationally. Many organizations aren't very self-critical in that way. So it's interesting how much um, analytics is done on, on um, consumer behavior, because you want to sell them more stuff, but very little is done on what the organization does with the data. Mm -hmm. But we are getting to the point that I think, I hope, that we start to go, well, what kind of data actually is, is needed? What is an intelligent way of inferring information without making people give up so much more data? So um, in a previous role, I did a lot of work around, um, we, we did a piece of user research internally and found that actually one of the biggest reasons the services and apps demanded data from people um, was for eligibility purposes, just to work out if someone was eligible or not. Now, given that actually, unless when I was uh, when I was younger, I worked in a in a cinema, and um, you had to selling tickets, you'd catch kids out who were trying to see a film that they weren't old enough to see by asking them date, their date of birth really quickly. Um, and it was amazing to me the number of kids who just hadn't bothered to work it out before they stood in front of you <laughs> and said, like, hey. um, which is always fun. Um, but Similarly, you can't stop someone from lying on one of those forms. So actually collecting that data in the first place is pointless. If really all you're interested in, and you have no way of verifying anyway, if all you're interested in is 
if they're over the age of consent. So beginning to think intelligently, again, that's a holistic problem. It's about how you design UX. It's about, it's about being aware of the, the, the storage calamity that is going to be for you and those sorts of things. Now, now this is somewhere where blockchain might actually help. <laughs> and what we're talking about is a place to coordinate attestations about things from a point of origin. Uh, and there's ways to do so in what's called like zero knowledge um, preserving ways such that you don't necessarily even need to disclose the underlying information but can actually verify what it was. And a birthday is something yeah. that's commonly given as that. Now, of course, that needs to be tied to someone who vets what your birthday is. You can't just say what your birthday is. Um, so you still end up having various points of roots of trust, whether that's your government or your Tinder profile or what have you. Um, but a, a coordination of attestations, as long as they can also be reliably revoked, um, is a, a completely valid thing to do. Um, what I was going to mention uh, be before that um, great point you made also was that um, safety and security, it's not just about the data though, it's also about the processes yeah. that we have around them. Um, and for example, um, I once worked with a program that was doing, uh, well, they were, they were doing uh, domestic abuse kind of oh, support and awareness and things. Um, but they were sending emails back to make sure that people who contacted them uh, were okay or like, let's sign up for your newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, without thinking that very often uh, those women's email accounts are surveyed by the people who are controlling their lives. Mm -hmm. So, deter and which could cause them literal physical ramifications, right? So, so thinking through um, not just what data we collect, but if somebody changes a privacy setting to turn on share my location, do you then send an email that uh, notifies the original owner of that? How do you treat backup contacts in your applications? Uh, and this is one of the reasons that we need to have inclusive and diverse development teams because people who have not necessarily ever had to think like someone who might be needing to evade someone else um, sometimes doesn't do a great job. We can say think like your attacker all that you want. Sometimes you want someone who may have actually been attacked. Mm -hmm. Wow. One thing I was going to mention is um, the energy sector, because of um, smart metering, um, it's actually taking all of these kind of things together. Um, and it, because it's you know, regulated and very, um, they need to do it right, essentially. They're, they're essentially, in my opinion, taking the right approach, where they're trying to build in um, big data as in analyzing when people are using hot water, for example, maybe have that ready at the time they typically use it versus all the time, so it's saving them money, as well as um, doing it in a way that is anonymous, versus, well, as, as much as it can be, versus saying, you know, this person at this house uses water at this time, because then that information, from the hacker's point of view, could be quite beneficial if I'm trying to, you know, break in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have a few more minutes for questions from the audience now. If anyone has any questions, could you raise your hand and then we'll bring a mic over to you. I do love GDPR, per se, the protection of my data. One of the things I'm frightened of, I've been a type 1 diabetic since I was 4, so that's 40, 41 years now. I have a huge amount of data. Most of it off net, but I had an instant pump that I couldn't rip the data off. It was closed system. I mean, open banking, if you want to open anything, it should be bloody healthcare because I want my data. <laughs> the company in question bins my data every two years. So this pump is actually a dead item to me. It's absolutely useless. I ditched it on the way to months as a result, because it was so fundamentally unusable. It was shared on data for three years with my health provider, and in the NHS my health provider has so many people who they're not actually interested, so they're bidding my data, but I can't get to my data, and that, for me, is something that GDPR is not looking after. That's fair. I, mean, I think sort of yeah, I think that's a good point, and I, I think a lot of times that when I go into a organisation, they say, "Okay, build me the most secure communications," and I say, "Okay, but the first question you ask is why? Why do you need to secure this, and what is this data you're securing?" And a lot of the times, people are like, "I want the biggest, shiniest, coolest technology," and technology isn't always the solution. Um, sometimes it's just seeing what your users are doing, what their processes are, um, and so that they 
can use it, you know, it's not just memorizing a really, really long, unique password, it's also something they can use, and um, how they're using it. So, obviously, healthcare, very important for you as the patient, essentially, you, you need to know, especially with diabetes, you need to know what's going on with your body as it changes, um, but also, um, in a way, that's going to be maintained long term. So, as you said, you know, if they just throw it out, that data has value to you. You obviously want it, but they didn't take that when they did. You know how you typically use like user acceptance. Um, a lot of times, organisations don't ever consider the customer <laughs> when they build a solution, and that's really unfortunate because that in itself is limiting their abil their ability to succeed. Do is a really good example because I personally quite like it. Um, and it, it focuses on well, what does the user need and what's going to be the least barrier for enabling that second form of authentication versus a lot of apps that are like, okay, well, press this, type this in, enter that, go there, say yes to this. And that's not considering the consumer. Mm -hmm. So it's a good point. I guess like in the diabetes example, so I'm, I'm not sure the exact device that you had, but um, I know the NHS are either trialing or it's kind of out there now, but the diabetes digital coach, so then you can kind of constantly monitor. But I, th I guess the point is it depends on how for how long that data is useful to you and whether or not that is less time than is useful to the vendor and if you kind of need it immediately in real time to kind of self manage then yeah <laughs> Sorry. you yeah, could just go to you could go to um, go show them twitter where you can download all your tweets and be like, I want to do this for my results. Yeah. <laughs> it's super great that everybody wants like their healthcare information to take with them, and it would be obviously helpful to port between providers. But I mean, we think that people are bad at managing their own passwords. Let's have them manage their own private keys. Um, you know, figuring out what the actual storage system for that kind of data, because as a human, now am I responsible for implementing my own GDPR rules? When should what does data hygiene mean? You know, individuals don't necessarily uh, know or have the skill set, and you think we ask them a lot now just to do strong passwords. Now we're going to ask them to do a constant data management exercise. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing, you know, I hear in like the Bitcoin community all the time. It's like, be your own bank, you have the power. But like, there's a reason we use banks because like I don't want people stealing all my money all the time. <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's all well and good to, to have that power, and perhaps a certain percentage of the population is going to become incredibly empowered through that. But there is an incredibly, incredible long tail of people for whom it could be a very, very bad thing. And we, we need to make sure we're building tools that it, it think about them all holistically. I mean, for me, one, one of the first computer systems I ever used had three modes, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And I would like to be a different person on different systems because when it comes to my diabetes, I don't want some bloody digital coach telling me what's what. I know what's what. <laughs> when it comes to cryptography, I know what's what. When it comes to using the new HR system, absolutely, I'll fucking be good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want that control. I want to be the person I am. Mm -hmm. But I think that goes back to the user experience considerations. I mean, yeah. like you said, a lot of users are not going to want to have to be responsible for all of that. But we can build systems, we can build um, environments that allow them to choose where they can be. Um, I think it's funny that you're, as a blockchain person, you're like, well, some people want to forget information. <laughs> and that's, that is true. It's, it's dependent on what service you're using, in what context, what information. I mean, I would never, ever, ever imp say, this is a solution for everything. When anybody asks me security questions, I always say, well, it depends. And it annoys the hell out of people, but it really does depend down to exactly what service they're using in mind. But that's what every expert, any time you ask someone and they don't come up with it depends, and they're probably not an expert in the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that. <laughs> One more question. Um, so, um, Amber, you mentioned that Bitcoin would be really useful for uh, a central attestation tool, so I only have to give my, I only need to authenticate once and then lots of other things can authenticate. And mixing the streams back to, to Wendy's stream, um, unless you understand how it works, how do we convince <coughs> the general public that it's actually secure? 
because you've got to hear people go, oh yeah, and oh, who's got my data, who's got access to it, and the government wants to now check without paying my taxes mm -hmm. or something. So whilst we know that technically it's really good, I'm not sure we'll be able to yeah. sell it to the general public. Yeah, um, I think all, all of the kind of privacy and security of that kind of thing would needs to be abstracted away from the user. They're not going to understand um, most of this stuff. Uh, I would not suggest that we use the Bitcoin blockchain for this at all. I was just talking more about the kind of uh, way to distribute this information in a decentralized <coughs> way. But uh, the, the magic of uh, what's happening with zero knowledge research and to a lesser extent with some things like um, SGX chipsets and additional hardware signing tools, um, which are great as part of a defense in depth stack, but very bad as a single point of failure, um, is that you don't have to ever give up the information. It might never leave your control. There's some, uh, there's ways now to hold on to this data yourself. Perhaps, let's say you do have your healthcare data, um, and it is in your own kind of secure enclave. Let's assume it's not on your phone with you all the time, but somewhere else. <laughs> and uh, you want to participate in a medical study. Rather than shipping all of your data off to that place, they might be able to send an encrypted algorithm to you, which can execute in your own local space. Um, in a way such that you don't even know necessarily what was executed, so hopefully you do need to make sure it's a verifiable kind of test. But, um, and then that information can go back, perhaps without disclosing who you are, other than the sort of biomedical markers that are required for that test. So it's not so much, I don't think we're able to rebuild a lot of this trust. I'm kind of a pessimist in that way. Um, but lowering the barrier to doing things together without having to trust things um, could be interesting. And being able to do that in a way because your data has not left you, you could be paid in a microtransaction for that experience. I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, but like the millennials, uh, they, they use the Instagrams. Um, and they're figuring out how to like monetize a like-based existence. Uh, so the idea that, um, you know, given the trade-off between uh, privacy and security and convenience, people have always chosen convenience because we haven't had monetization or economics to tip the scale there. So there, there is an opportunity to come up with new business models, which, which may be worse than the gig economy, I don't know. Um, but uh, where we can thread the needle between that. But yeah, do not put your personal identifiable information on the Bitcoin blockchain. <laughs> Just to add to that, and I think, again, it kind of mirrors um, one of the points Wendy made, that, and to your point about selling this to the public, I think that n there is no ecosystem that we can build where we won't at some point have to sell it to the public. Um, and it's the reason why we need institutions and why I am really nervous about how blockchain is very often, of course not the way Amber's presenting it, but how, <laughs> how it's very often presented as enabling this misanthropic world in which we just don't need to trust. Mm -hmm. So even things like, you know, um, either, so in the example you cited about I hold my personal data, um, an algorithm essentially extracts the information that it needs and only the response is sent off, there's still an element of trust there. First, you have to be able to trust that my data is real data, that my health data is real data, especially there's a monetary, um, monetary incentive for me to, to lie or generate false data. Um, but also that it will be used in the way that the organization that, is, that generates this algorithm is claiming it will be used. And for that, we still need institutions. So one of the, the and, you know, these things swing back and forth with technology all the time, that we get past the hype of, oh, wow, we can live in this world that is essentially a digital failed state because obviously that's kind of narrative that only only people who've never lived in a nightmare failed state would ever want to unleash on the rest of the world. Um, but that we can move beyond that kind of narrative to something that is, that is a lot more collaborative and that starts to generate and, and recognize the need for trust and that that trust resides in other people because the whole point of working collaboratively is that you have to work with other people, yeah. at least some of the time. And, and I, you're completely right. And also, I'm incredibly concerned about the ability for um, institutions or governments to compel data from you that you now have, that maybe previously it was simply security yes. through obscurity, that who knows yes. where the hell that data was. Mm -hmm. um, and also the opportunity that we're going to have to create classes of metadata now, yeah. such that, yeah, sure, I can instantaneously disclose to you what my, my birth date is, but do you need it from my passport, which also 
also proves that I'm a citizen? Yeah. Or do you need it from a different kind of identity sort of system? Yeah. Um, so there's tons of terrible Orwellian kind of dystopic yeah. kind of uh, futures that we could end up in. But that's that's why, you know, I, it's, it's not worth sitting back and just saying like, well, let's see what happens. <laughs> let's watch. Um, because we can work to, to make uh, hopefully that not be the future and it can be more collaborative. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, I think we've run out of time now, but big thanks to all of my panelists. You are great. Uh, the only thing is we really should have been playing buzzword bingo for all of that. <laughs> but yeah, so thanks. And we now have another break. So be back here at 3.45 for the next talk.